So, so thanks, uh, and thanks also for having me uh, to, to come to talk to you today about um, the, the topic, which is uh, the integration of Citrix and Desktop and ZenApp with, um, with CloudStack. Uh, my name's uh, Paul Howard. Uh, I'm an engineer with Citrix Systems. Uh, I'm a Brit, as you can tell. Uh, I work uh, in the Camborne office uh, in Cambridgeshire in the UK. I've worked for Citrix for very nearly uh, four years, uh, and I've spent the latter between one and a half and two years uh, as the tech lead for this project to integrate Zen Desktop and Zen App with cloud technologies, uh, those being Cloud Stack um, or, or Cloud Platform, its Citrix variant, uh, and um, also Amazon Web Services. So here's what I'm going to cover. We'll talk a little bit about the product itself, um, Zen Desktop and, and Zen App, uh, just to set the scene. Uh, as I said, I'm an engineer, so it's going to be an engineer's introduction, a very high-level technical overview. Uh, I'm not a salesperson. I'm not wearing a suit. And then we'll go on to talk about what, what actually what motivates all this um, for a product that has more traditionally been associated with bare metal hypervisors. Why would customers of this product want to move to a cloud stack based deployment? Um, and therefore what motivates us uh, to have undertaken this project in the first place? And then I'll talk a little bit, um, the, the bulk of the talk will, will be about the, the experience of doing that development work uh, against cloud stack. Um, and I'll start with the things that stand out in my memory as having gone particularly well, um, what I consider to be the highlights, um, the things that I'm very pleased with. Uh, and then we'll go on to talk about perhaps what, what didn't go so well. Um, where, where were some of the barriers, the risks, uh, the challenges, uh, and some of the learning points that we faced. Uh, so that's what I'm going to cover. Um, if, if I don't have time at the end for questions, and I can't guarantee that I will have uh, I'm, I'm here, as they say, all week, uh, which is to say for the rest of today. Uh, so if you do have any questions uh, that, are, that are burning in your mind, I'm around, come and find me, tap me on the shoulder if you can reach it. Okay, uh, so a quick dive in then, an engineer's introduction to Zen Desktop and Zen App. What is, what are Zen Desktop and Zen App? Well, the tagline, is it's work and play from anywhere, right? Basically what you have is you have users, uh, any location, any device, wanting to connect to either a full Windows desktop or an enterprise Windows application mixed seamlessly with whatever system they're using. That's the basic value proposition. This is what Zen, As Zen Desktop and Zen App do. Well, how do they do that? Uh, well, it's a layer of management infrastructure uh, at the heart of which uh, is a server component known as the delivery controller. The delivery controller runs um, a suite of interacting services. It's, it's a service-oriented architecture. Um, they perform a variety of tasks of varying importance. Um, these are the services that will actually provision the virtual machines that will ultimately host the user's workloads. Uh, they also manage what we call brokering. So brokering is well, as, as the name suggests, we have our users and their endpoints down here. Brokering is the name of the process that actually gives the user, the incoming user, a connection to either the desktop or application that uh, they want to use. A delivery controller might not stand by itself. Obviously, it has quite a lot of work to do. Uh, in a production environment, there's likely to be more than one of them uh, for load balancing uh, and, and for failover and the like, uh, for scalability. But e even in a situation where you have more than one delivery controller, they are conceptually taking part in what is the same single deployment. Uh, and that deployment is known as a site. And all of the persistent state uh, associated with the Zen desktop site uh, is stored in a single SQL database. And all of the controllers share that database. So no matter how many controllers you have, the basic characteristics of your site and the basic data that makes up your site is all in the database, and there is only one of those. Modulo mirroring, clustering, and all the rest of it. Uh, there are some user interface components. 
Um, I've included one of them here. There, there are actually two key ones. I've included one in the diagram. Um, there is uh, a Microsoft management console snap-in called Studio. Studio is the management console that administrators will use to do the, the heavy lifting of the site, the basic setup of the site, the initial integration, the provisioning of machines, setting up the definitions of uh, which users can access which resources. Uh, that will all happen through Studio. What you don't do through Studio is, is you don't tend to do the the day-to-day -day health checking and monitoring and performance checking. That's not done through Studio. That's done through a web-based console that's called Desktop Director, uh, which I haven't included on the diagram, but it is there. Desktop Director guys will kill me. So then, of course, you have something underwriting uh, the power of your whole system, which is your hosting infrastructure. Uh, traditionally, this is your hypervisors. Um, your storage and your network substrate, hosting a series of virtual machines, uh, and these are the virtual machines that actually run the user's workloads. Uh, for VDI desktops, these are single-user Windows desktop machines. Uh, for, uh, if, for something like Zen App, where you're delivering applications to multiple users, then they're more likely to be server machines, multi-session capable machines with RDS. Uh, that can um, run multiple applications simultaneously and have multiple login sessions simultaneously. So connecting that all together, uh, there is a front-end component uh, known as Storefront. Um, this is the gateway that users initially connect to. This is something that could, for example, run well, it can run as a native desktop application or it can run inside your web browser. It's the thing that shows you all of the desktop resources and all of the application resources that the system is making available to you, um, give, given the credentials you have logged in as. Uh, and that is the point at which you select what you want to use, you click on what you want to use, and the broker will then connect you to that session, uh, and you'll be, you'll be up and away. So when we talk about something like this, and integrating it with CloudStack. Obviously, the, the primary thing we're talking about there is, is using cloud as the hosting infrastructure. Uh, so where all of those virtual machines are running there at the top, we're, we're aiming that uh, into a CloudStack environment. But having said that, there is um, every, every likelihood, I think, that. Uh, if, if you're going for a cloud-hosted deployment, you might run some of your, some or all of your management infrastructure in that cloud-hosted deployment as well. So, so don't preclude the possibility of things like delivery controllers, database servers, uh, going into the cloud alongside uh, all of those virtual machines that are running the user's workloads. Okay, I keep saying Zen Desktop and Zen App uh, in the same breath. Um, what actually is the difference between them? Well, for the purpose of this discussion, uh, there really isn't one. A Zen app is an older product uh, than Zen Desktop, and it previously had a different architecture. Zen Desktop introduced a newer architecture. FMA stands for FlexCast Management Architecture, FlexCast simply being the overarching term that talks about that basic capability of getting applications and desktops to users on any device. Uh, both of these products, um, since the release of Zen Desktop 7, uh, both of these products actually now use the same architecture. Um, the difference between them now it is, is not so much in the technology, it's very much in the use case. Uh, you would use Zen Desktop for VDI, you'd use Zen App for applications, obviously. Um, the difference is whether you're doing single session or multi-session VMs. But those two use cases uh, are sufficiently fundamentally distinct uh, in the minds of customers that we do find it helpful to have the separate branding around those two use cases. But the diagram I showed you uh, on the previous slide, for the purpose of the rest of this discussion, that's the product we're talking about. Whether you call it Zen Desktop or Zen App, that's the technology. And from now on, I'll use the two terms interchangeably. So why would you move to CloudStack uh, with a product that is, is, is more like a legacy product, a, a product that is um, more traditionally associated with bare metal hypervisors? 
Well, for a start, um, of course, we have a system that's built on open standards. Uh, and this allows customers, the, gives them the ability to build the cloud while retaining a great deal of power and a great deal of choice uh, over what technologies they use to build it. Um, now, Zen Desktop has traditionally been associated with multi-vendor hosting solutions already, um, working with more than one type of hypervisor. Um, so it, it's, it's very natural for us to adopt something like CloudStack, which, which leaves that decision uh, in the customer's domain. They can choose their hypervisor. They can choose their storage and network. Uh, and the storage, of course, being tiered into local, shared, and secondary layers, so, so people have the choice as to whether they're going to use, um, say, NFS or iSCSI block storage, um, whether they're going to adopt cluster or zone primary storage, or whether they're going to consider some host direct attach storage in the mix as well. It's a cloud, but it isn't necessarily a public cloud, right? So we, we maintain the ability for customers to either choose to adopt a public infrastructure that's based on CloudStack or to build it uh, on-premise themselves. A and with that choice um, comes the ability to actually use the client Windows OS. Uh, if you've used public cloud infrastructure like AWS, you might be aware that you can't run Windows client instances on that infrastructure. Um, the reason being that the Microsoft licensing does not permit uh, for service providers uh, to make the client OS available. But if you're building on-premise, um, then that potentially becomes an option. Uh, and of course, it's a cloud. It expands on demand. You can build it at any scale. And regardless of that scale, you can manage the whole thing from uh, a single management console. So just as a for instance, um, a, couple of, uh, a couple of rigs that we built during this project, here's one of them, a uh, test rig, um, two clusters of, uh, of eight hosts each, uh, a system that could scale to about 1,000 desktops. Um, th this was used in test. Is this a system that I used? Well, no, because there are like budgets and stuff. That's the one that I used, uh, scaling to about five desktops, a much, shall we say, a much more modest system. Um, but it suited my needs nonetheless. Okay, so we've talked about the product uh, and we've talked uh, about some of the key motivating factors with why we would choose to integrate it with CloudStack. So I want to share the experience uh, of, of what that was like, um, starting with the things that I went particularly well. I joined the project um, a little over a year and a half ago um, I didn't implement the whole thing. Uh, we started with a working prototype. So there's a lot that I probably should include in the section that follows that I may not include in the section that follows because I am guilty of taking a heck of a lot of things for granted. There is a lot in CloudStack that does simply just work. Uh, and actually being here this week it has, um, it has really sort of helped open my eyes to that and, and, and remind me of that. But I do want to call out a few specific things. I'll mention these briefly and then go into some detail. So first of all, there is the similarity with AWS. There is the fact that the project, we were, we were working with a, a fluid system, a system that we could modify, uh, and the project did result in several CloudStack enhancements. And we flushed out some useful bugs. Um, that, that, that's a positive, absolutely. Uh, we, we, we like bugs when we can find them and fix them. Um, Zen Desktop, of course, is a complex workload. Uh, it taxed the system in ways that it was perhaps not used to being taxed. So starting with the similarity to AWS. Uh, as I said at the start, we ran two integration projects pretty much side by side, uh, one to integrate with CloudStack and one to integrate with AWS. Um, it was obviously very helpful to us uh, that CloudStack in lots of ways follows the AWS model. Um, there are lots of common concepts between the two. Uh, we have our regions, zones, security groups, all of the things listed here coming packaged with pretty much um, the, roughly the same semantics uh, in most cases, roughly the same kinds of API uh, to manipulate them. 
And um, a very nice thing about the Cloud Stack API uh, is that the service offerings can be enumerated dynamically. This is something you can't do in Amazon. If anybody has familiarity with EC2 and driving that system through the API, um, the, the list of instance types is actually not available for dynamic query. Uh, it's only in the documentation. So this similarity allowed for a genuinely useful amount of code sharing. Uh, I don't have the stats, um, so I'll make one up. Um, my gut feel is that it, it was probably around 70% shared code between the AWS integration project and the CloudStack integration project. And perhaps more importantly than the code we were able to share, we were able to create um, a, a similar user experience um, with these two technologies as well. Um, this was very helpful to us in the, in the product design phase. So uh, all, of the, all of the wizards, all of the workflows that the users have to go, to, go through um, to set up hosting on Amazon versus CloudStack, uh, they, are, they are pretty much the same. They, they differ only in, in very minor detail. So that, uh, for me, was a big plus point. So CloudStack enhancements. Um, now, as I say, I, I joined the project about a year and a half ago, a little more than that. Um, and I can't claim with certainty that everything I'm going to list here was motivated by Zen Desktop and only Zen Desktop. Um, it's possible that some of these things were coming along in CloudStack anyway. Um, but uh, at, as, as the tech lead on the Zen Desktop side, I, I, was, I, I was privileged and um, fortunate enough to work with uh, a, a great team of Cloud Snack and Cloud Platform engineers at Citrix. Um, we built a fantastic functional dialogue with them throughout the project. Uh, it's something that I'm very pleased about. Uh, it's something that I hope we can maintain. And this has allowed for some more streamlined integration patterns um, compared with some of the equivalent things we had to do on AWS. So at, as an example, um, one of the things we have in Zen Desktop is the concept of a pooled desktop, a pooled machine, um, which can be assigned to any user randomly. Uh, and it is based on a centralized master image. The administrator defines exactly what that master image is. Every user gets the same master image. And once a user logs off, that, it, that desktop can actually be assigned to another user and it will just reboot. It will lose any changes and it will just reset to its previous state. Uh, and similarly, the administrator can roll it forward uh, onto a new image to install new applications or Windows updates. Now, so one of the things we have in CloudStack now is we actually have the Restore Virtual Machine API, um, which gives us exactly that facility natively uh, without having to reprovision a machine we have the ability to either roll it back to the template it was originally provisioned from or roll it forward onto a new template while keeping it remaining the same machine. Uh, on Amazon, we can't do that. Uh, is, that, is, that is that an API um, available to anything, anything besides Right, so the, the question was, was that Restore Virtual Machine API available to other, other callers besides Zen Desktop? Yes, it is. Yes, absolutely. Yes, it, it's part of the core. Uh, cloud Platform User API. Uh, on, on AWS, we actually have to reprovision machines uh, in order to satisfy that facility. So, so there are cases where we need heavyweight workarounds uh, for things that we can do in a much more optimized way with CloudStack. Um, we can create machines in a stop state. Sounds quite simple, sounds quite trivial, um, but it's actually very nice uh, because one of the things we do have to do in Zen Desktop is assemble machines with multiple attached disks. Uh, and we like the machines to be stopped when we do that. Um, on, on Amazon, every machine we create is already running when we create it, so we actually have to work quite hard to stop it, to stabilize it, to attach the additional disks and then start it up again. Uh, on CloudStack, we can create machines that are stopped. It's much more streamlined. Uh, implicit dedication, I, I have a feeling this was coming along in CloudStack anyway. This is the model whereby you can set up a service offering uh, that guarantees that instances will not share hardware with those from other tenants, but where the system otherwise self-organizes itself underneath to actually make sure that that happens. Uh, it's, a, it's a capability that Amazon has. A 16K user data allowance, um, again, 
possibly sounds quite trivial, uh, but there is one particular use case we have in Zen Desktop where we do need to be able to pass uh, a fairly sizable packet of user data to some of the worker instances that we spin up. Uh, and we were limited by the previous data allowance. Um, uh, and, and without actually being able to increase that, uh, we, we would have been in some serious trouble architecturally. So, so, so that really helped us out uh, as well. Um, so those are just a few. Those are a few that stick in my memory. There are, there are some more. Um, but basically, the theme is uh, you're working with something you can change, uh, and you've got a team of people working with you uh, who can help you change it. Uh, and, and that, to me, w was just, um, just in invaluable uh, throughout the project. Let's talk about bugs. So yes, uh, we found some bugs. We found some bugs uh, in, in CloudStack. We might have found one or two in, in Zen Desktop as, as well, maybe. Uh, so there were over 100, I, I think, reported um, associated with the Zen Desktop integration, particularly uh, in our JIRA system uh, throughout the project so far. Uh, I say so far, um, meant to say at the start that this project has just reached a very important milestone with the release last month of uh, Zen Desktop and Zen App 7.5, um, which is the first release to, to actually contain this integration. Um, but, but we also have work ongoing. Uh, 63 fixed uh, and closed in the 4.3 and 4.2.1 branches uh, at the time of writing. Um, and I think yours truly is responsible for about 11 of them. Uh, so I can't resist but share a couple of war stories. We had, uh, now going back two years, I hadn't even heard of DNS Mask, um, which runs on the CloudStack virtual router. Uh, but we did have a problem where the Windows instances that we were running inside the cloud uh, were not registering in DNS with a Windows domain controller that was running outside of the cloud. Um, and we found that uh, there, was a, there was a DNS mask proxying issue going on there so that the, the, the records were not actually making it past the CloudStack virtual router. Um, so, so this was one of the problems we, we flagged up and we actually got the necessary DHCP options set in the uh, virtual router in initialization script. Uh, in order to fix that for us. Um, custom disk offerings. Uh, we found custom disk offerings were making us disks of the wrong size. Uh, one of the things we need to do in Zen Desktop is, we, I was saying before, we have to attach multiple disks um, to machines. And, so, and, and they vary in size. Um, there, there's a particular small one that we need to attach and, and sometimes a larger one that we need to attach and we use custom disk offerings to specify the size of the disk we want. And what we found was as soon as we had created one small disk via this offering and attached it to a VM, every other disk we created with the same offering would be the same size, even if we specified a different size through the API. Um, so we actually found there was, some, there was some broken caching going on effectively. And as soon as we'd made a disk of one size, that size was actually sticky. Uh, and although we were specifying a different size in the subsequent API calls, um, we got the wrong size disk coming out. So some delightful head scratching over that one, um, but that one we flushed out and, and, and it's now fixed. Uh, this one was the cause of some controversy as to whether you would actually class it as a bug or not. But we did find, again, uh, with this dynamic disk attachment that we do, we do quite a lot of work with data volumes. Uh, we found that, um, okay, I, I'm running short on time, so I'll have to speed up. Uh, the, the data disk IDs ch changed on cluster migration. So if a volume ever moved from one cluster to another, its ID would actually change. If we tried to reference it with the ID that we got when we created it, uh, it would say the disk was not found. Uh, so that was another one. So, so those were some of the bugs. Uh, what were some of the challenges that we faced? Uh, some of the things that perhaps held us up a bit and didn't go so well. Uh, again, I'll go through the categories and then elaborate a little. Understanding the performance of your storage is one of them. The API documentation was another. Uh, and error reporting, when things go wrong. Hypervisor-specific behavior, if there, if there is time, I will get onto that. So 
Uh, Zen Desktop and Zen App, they work with Windows images. Uh, with Windows, you have a bit of a QA problem. Quantity assurance um, templates for Windows are big. Copying from secondary to primary storage is a significant overhead. Uh, and that there are many components within the system contributing to this overhead. You've got the hypervisors, you have the secondary storage VM, you have the storage itself, and you have potentially diff different people um, using the storage at the same time uh, with non-obvious linearization constraints. And we found that with some of the rigs that we built, we actually had to work quite hard um, to, to make them usable. Uh, there were some that were performing slowly for reasons that we just didn't understand. And we could build a rig on one site and build a rig on another site uh, and, and have one of them inexplicably performing so badly that it might take 90 minutes to start an instance uh, with the copying from secondary to primary storage with, with, with no obvious reason why. Uh, and sometimes small configuration changes, non-obvious configuration changes would make the system usable. Uh, a quick tour of API documentation. So we have complete API documentation because it's generated automatically, uh, but some of the behavior specifications are brief. Some of the parameter specifications are unclear. Um, I won't go through all of these examples because I don't have time. We had an issue with string length and content limitations, so sometimes we would specify names for objects, but we'd make the name too long, or we'd introduce characters that were not allowed, uh, and we'd get errors back from the API, but a bit of extra documentation in the API would have prevented us from hitting that problem in the first place. Uh, so for, ex for example, here's the API that uh, creates tags on resources. Um, yes, a, a fairly brief behavioral description there, but I, I suppose it's not, you don't have to work too hard to figure out what create tags does. But the fun begins a little further down where you have specified a resource type and it, there's no explanation as to what strings you actually have to specify for the resource type. We had to do some Googling uh, and, and some research on, the, um, on, on user forums to, to find out what those strings were. So error reporting, when things, when things go wrong, um, one of the problems we had was that we'd quite often get back single error codes, things like a, a 530 server error, for example, uh, and in some cases, we actually had to parse error strings. We actually had to detect text uh, within the error messages coming out uh, from, from CloudStack to, to find out exactly what went wrong. Obviously, that's a very error-prone process itself, uh, and we, we hit some issues as, as a result of that. Um, there is the, the need often to consult the management logs uh, in order to debug deployment failures. Many of the rigs we were using were small. They weren't actually very very well resourced, uh, as, as you saw in my diagrams earlier on. Um, so it was actually quite common for VM deployments to fail with things like server capacity problems. Um, but these problems are not evident uh, at the API level. You have to go into the, the management server log to find them. OK, hypervisor specific behavior, I don't think there'll be time to, to cover this. But we, we did have some problems where we would test some functionality on Zen server and it would work fine and then we would test the same fun functionality on VMware and, and it wouldn't. Um, again, disk, um, disk device mappings were one of the issues here. Uh, VMware, of course, being a more, more complete kind of virtualized hardware system as opposed to Zen, uh, we found that if we attached disks at specific positions and then expected those disks to be available on particular devices within the guest, uh, often that didn't always meet our expectations. Um, likewise, we found that if we attached a disk to, Zen, to a Linux machine on Zen server dynamically, that, machine, that disk would hot plug very easily into the running guest system. Uh, but on VMware, it wouldn't hot plug. We would actually have to go and scan the attached disks to, to actually explicitly go and find it before we could use it. Uh, so there were a few variations between the hypervisor types um, that, that we found. Uh, throughout the work. Okay, I'm, I'm probably either at time or a little over time. Uh, so uh, I think I'd better stop it there, say thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the final day. <laughs>